May the holy names of Jesus and Mary be blessed now and forever in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we have the great pleasure today to celebrate a great mystic and doctor and great light in the church, Saint John of the Cross. This is the great saint today, a 16th century Carmelite priest best known for reforming his order together with St. Teresa of Avila and for writing the classic spiritual treatise, The Dark Night of the Soul. Honored a doctor of the church since 1926, he is, as we all know, called the mystical doctor as a tribute to the depth of his teaching on the soul's union with Almighty God. The youngest child of parents of a silk weaving trade, John of Epes was born way back in 1542, a place called Fontiveros, near the Spanish city of Avila. His father Gonzalo died at a relatively young age and his mother Catalina struggled to provide for the family. John found academic success from his early years, but failed in his effort to learn a trade as an apprentice. Instead, he spent several years working in a hospital for the poor and continued his studies at a Jesuit college in the town of Medina del Campo. Even from an early age, the, the mantle of Our Lady was upon this great saint. When he was only five years of age, he fell down a well and Our Lady's hand took him out of the well unharmed. After discerning his call to monastic life, John entered the Carmelite order in 1563. Already he had been practicing severe physical asceticism or mortification even before joining the Carmelites. And he got permission to live according to their original rule of life, which involved solitude, silence, poverty, work, and contemplative prayer. John was ordained as a priest in 1567 after studying at Salamanca, but considered then transferring to the more austere life of the Carthusian order rather than to continue with the Carmelites. Before he could actually take this step, he encountered a nun, a great, another great mystic of the church and canonized who we know as St. Teresa of Avila. She was born in the same t period in 1515, and she had joined the order in 1535 regarding consecrated life as the most secure road to eternal salvation. Since that time, she had, made, she had made remarkable progress, and during the 1560s, she began a movement to return the Carmelites, as we know, to the strict observance of their original life. She convinced then John of the Cross to remain as a Carmelite and to work for its reform. He then changed his name, he was called John of St. Matthias, to John of the Cross. And the priest began this work of change in November 1568, accompanied by two other men, of the order whom whom he shared an austere and small house. For a time, John was in charge of the new recruits to this discult, discalced Carmelites, the name adopted by the reform group, since they wore sandals rather than ordinary shoes as a sign of poverty. He spent five years as a confessor then in the monastery of Avila led by Saint Teresa. This reforming movement then, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grew quickly, but it met with great opposition. Great opposition that jeopardized its future during the 1570s. Early in December 1577, during a dispute over John's assignment within the order, the opponents of the strict observance seized and imprisoned him and placed him in a tiny cell. This ordeal lasted nine months and included regular public floggings along with other harsh punishments. 
Yet it was during this period, through the grace of God and God's providence, that he composed the poetry that would serve as the basis for his later spiritual writings. He managed to escape audaciously with some bedsheets hanging out of the window in August 1578, and he resumed his work of reforming the discalced Carmelite communities. Over the course of a decade, he set out his spiritual teachings in such magnificent works, if you probably some of you might have read these, such as the, As the Ascent of Mount Carmel, the Spiritual Canticle, the Living Flame of Love, as well as the Dark Night of the Soul. But intrigue within the order eventually cost him his leadership position, and his last years were marked with illness along with further mistreatment. His axiom, or what we call is this self-evident truth that needs no proof, is that the soul must empty itself in order to be filled with God, that it must be purified of the last traces of earthly dross before it is fit to become united with the Almighty. In the application then of this simple maxim, he shows the most uncompromising logic. Supposing, he says, the soul with which he deals to be habitually in a state of grace and pushing forward to better things, he overtakes it on the very road leading it in its opinion to God, in its opinion to God, and lays open before its eyes a number of sores in which it was altogether ignorant, what he terms the spiritual capital sins. Not until these are removed, which is a most formidable task, is it fit to be admitted to what he calls the dark night, which consists of this passive purgation where God, by heavy trials, particularly interior ones, perfects and completes what the soul had begun of its own accord. It is now passive but not inert, for by submitting to the divine operation it cooperates in the measure of its power. Here lies one of the essential differences between John's mysticism and false quietism. The perfect purgation of the soul in the present life leaves it free to act with wonderful energy. In fact, it might almost be said to obtain a share in God's omnipotence, as is shown in many lives of great saints. As the soul emerges from the dark night, it enters into the full moonlight described in the spiritual canticle and in the living flame of love. St. John leads it to the highest heights then, in fact, to the point where it becomes a partaker in the divine nature. It is here that the necessity of the previous cleansing is clearly perceived. The pain of mortification of all the senses and the powers and the faculties of the soul being amply applied, repaid by the glory which is now being revealed in the very soul. Saint John, if we read some accounts of his life, has often been represented as some kind of a, a grim character, but nothing could be more untrue. He was indeed austere in the extreme with himself and to some extent also with others, but from his writings and depositions of those who knew him, we see him as a man burning with love of God, overflowing in charity and kindness, a poetically mind deeply influenced by all that is beautiful and attractive. John of the Cross then died in the early hours of December the 14th, 1591, nine years after the death of his great friend, Teresa of Avila, who died in October 1582. Suspicion, mistreatment, and humiliation had characterized most, much of the time of his religious life. But these trials are understood as having brought him closer to God by breaking his dependence on the things of the world. Accordingly, his writings stress the need to love God above all things, being held back by nothing, and likewise holding nothing back, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Only near the end of his life had John's monastic superior recognized 
his wisdom and holiness. Though his reputation had suffered unjustly for years, this reputation reversed soon after his death. He was beatified in the year 1675, canonized 1726, and as we said, was named the doctor of the church in the 20th century by the great Pope Pius XI. In a letter marking the 400th anniversary of St. John's death, Pope John Paul II, the great, who had written a doctoral thesis on the saint's writing, recommended the study of the Spanish mystic, whom he called a master in faith and witness to the living God. Let us then, today, read his works and put his words into practice and make his words our own as Jesus Christ appeared to this great saint toward the end of his life and asked him what reward he would like for his toils within his lifetime. He said, and in the same style as we read in the Old Testament, when Solomon asked the Lord for the gift of wisdom, St. John of the Cross asked Jesus Christ for wisdom, but in different words. He said, Lord, that I may suffer and be despised for thee. Lord, that I may suffer and be despised for thee. This is all that he wanted from the Lord towards the end of his life. Let us then enter with this help of this great mystic, Saint John of the Cross, the triple way of love and ascend to the Lord of hosts. First, the purgative or aesthetic way where we uproot all our vices. This void needs to be replaced by something good. These are the virtues. And you have thus entered into the way of the illumination, the second way. Do not stop here. Desire a life of heroic virtue, a life where you can enter the interior castle of your soul, the third, the final way, and contemplate the face of Jesus Christ crucified. This is the mystical marriage God desires for all souls. This is the way to save all souls with the transforming union with our soul with the Lord. Enter then, now ask for this grace, enter then the triple way of union and make every step with the Queen of Mystics herself, the Blessed Virgin Mary, so that one day you can gaze on the Holy Trinity in paradise in eternity forever and ever. Amen. May the holy names of Jesus and Mary and Joseph be blessed now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.